1 Timothy chapter 3, and let's again go to the Lord in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we are thankful for your blessings. We thank you, our Father, for each one who's come out today. We thank you for Brother Craig. We thank you for, uh, for the, the time that we've heard uh, the message earlier. Lord, for the uh, time of fellowship we've had with one another, for the singing. Lord, for the prayers of your people. Lord, we thank you for this time of worship. And now, even as we continue on in the worship service and into this, uh, this time of worship in the preaching of your word, Lord, I pray that you'll, uh, that you'll uh, be with me as I, as I preach. Lord, I pray that, uh, that your word will be presented in truth and received as such. Lord, I pray that that your word will find a lodging place in the hearts and the minds of your people. I ask, Lord, that, that uh, each one will be strengthened and edified and encouraged. Lord, and I pray that uh, any here who know thee not, that today may be the day that they come to know you as their Savior. Lord, I pray for those who could not be here. I think of, uh, of Sister Jill and Sister Tina. Pray that you'll be with them. I think of Brother Isaiah. I pray that you'll be with him in a, in a special way as he's away from us. I pray for uh, Sister Brenda. I think of uh, those that, uh, that are away uh, because of distance. I think of uh, Brother Nino, Sister Elsie, Brother Sam, and Sister Zelda. Lord, I pray for them. I ask that you'll be with those that have been mentioned for prayer on the prayer list. Lord, I, I pray for uh, Brother Malcolm, even as he was on his way here, and uh, the wreck that they saw. And I, I thank you for, uh, for watching over them as they traveled, but I pray for the, that uh, family that uh, may have been involved in the, the, the family of the one who lost their life. Lord, I just pray for, uh, for the... First responders, Lord, I thank you for them, and I pray that you'll uh, work in their lives, even as they work hard uh, on a day like this. And I pray that you'll uh, work in their lives and the things that they need, uh, physically, but ultimately spiritually, Lord. I pray, our Father, that you'll bless us in the remainder of the service and on into the business meeting. Lord, use us for thy name's only glory, that we may be a light and a testimony in this world that we live in. Forgive us of our sins and our shortcomings, for it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> All right, 1 Timothy chapter 3 will be our text this morning. We'll be reading verses 14 through 16, and so if you have your copy of God's Word, turn there and read 1 Timothy 3, verses 14 through 16. It says, These things write I unto thee, hoping to come unto thee shortly. But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar of ground of the truth, and without controversy. Great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. Our text this morning is coming from verse 16. The title of my message is The Mystery of Godliness. The Mystery of Godliness. Charles Spurgeon called this text the summary of true religion. This is the outline of the Christian faith, and it's all about Christ. Beloved, if your religion this morning is all about you, you have the wrong religion. If you have received a gospel which is not 
the gospel of Jesus Christ, then you have not received the true gospel. You have received another gospel, the wrong gospel. Throw it away. It's not the true gospel. As I preached the last Lord's Day that we were gathered together, you need to be sure that you are on the true foundation, Jesus Christ. Anything else, whatever it is, no matter how good it may seem, <clears throat> it is sinking sand. Look there in our text. Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. Great is the mystery of godliness. Not that there is something mysterious or secret about our religion. Not that there is something that cannot be understood. No, no. We are not mystery Babylon. That's not what he's talking about here. But re rather, there's something that was at one time hidden or unknown. It was a mystery. It's something that cannot, was not, revealed through human, his, through human reasoning. It was not discovered through human discovery. It's something that cannot be found through nature. And while Paul wrote to the Romans and he told them, if you remember from Romans chapter 1, he says that the heathen Gentiles were without excuse if they did not know God through the light of nature. We understand through the reading of scriptures and by looking at nature, that that light of nature is dim indeed. Nature reveals through us, to us that there is a God, but it does not tell us who God is. It does not tell us anything of Christ and how that Christ came and died does not tell us how we may please the God who created all things does not tell us any of those things indeed he is a mystery and this can be evidenced by the fact that you go all through the world and you look at the archaeological evidence and you see the anthropological evidence and you understand that in all countries and cultures and peoples there are temples and there are religions everyone has a desire to worship God but they did not understand who he was he was a mystery to them So Paul writes here, great is the mystery of godliness. How can we know this mystery? This can only be known by revelation from God. It can only be received by faith. The revelation we have is right here in God's Word. This truth, previously unknown, has been made known by the actual incarnation. The life, death, resurrection, and glorification of God in man. as he brings out here in this text. He wrote to Timothy and said, But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, 
the pillar and ground of the truth. Building on the message from last week, so long as the church remembers its foundation, the church is the pillar and ground of the truth. The foundation is in Christ. This is the most important message we preach. And so first of all, this mystery of godliness, God was manifest in the flesh. God was manifest in the flesh. And if you want to, if you want my outline, you'll begin to see it right there in the text. God was manifest in the flesh, point number one. In this, Paul is bringing out not only our Lord's birth, and we know that that's on the subject of a lot of people's lips, that's on a lot of people's lips today. <laughs> Tomorrow, that's part of it. But also his life here on earth. I chose this text today. You know, normally I am in Mark's Gospel on Sunday mornings. But it's okay to every once in a while go to another text and expound that. Many set this date aside to remember the birth of Christ. Whether you celebrate this day or not, it is good to remember that our Savior was born of a virgin in Bethlehem some 2,000 years ago. We don't know the date. We are unaware of what, when it was. <clears throat> but notice, Paul writes here under the inspiration of the Spirit, without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. This had to happen. Amen. This had to happen. The birth of our Lord was different. This was God manifest in the flesh. In Matthew chapter 1. Hold your place there. In 1 Timothy we'll be coming back. But in Matthew chapter 1. Verses 18 through 25. Matthew's gospel begins with a whole list of genealogies. A bunch of begats. Forty-one generations, I count. And then, in verse 18, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, when as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, she was found the child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man, and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privately. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took unto him his wife, and knew her not, till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. The birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. Having completed the genealogy, Matthew, writing under the inspiration of Spirit, wishes to give detail concerning the 
one star of the book. The gospel of Jesus Christ begins with the birth of Jesus. He's the one he is writing about, the reason he is writing it all, the reason why you and I are here today. The reason, beloved, why He was able to go to the cross to die for your sins and mine is because He was the only one who was born, yea, conceived of a virgin. Amen. The God-man, Christ Jesus. This conception, this birth, was different than anything the world had ever seen before, yea, different than anything that has ever happened since. Some 41 generations prior, a man fathers his son and so on in the normal biological manner. You can go back and you can read it. You can study it. Abraham begat Isaac, Isaac begat Jacob, Jacob begat Judas, and so on and so forth. And he goes on and on. Matthew records that. That's the way it always was. That's the way it had been. But the birth of Jesus did not happen that way. mother espoused to Joseph. They were engaged, but they had not come together in any kind of, there was not any kind of a sexual relationship between them. The virgin birth of our Lord is guarded in the text. Before they came together, the Bible says, she was found with child. It was her virginity was guarded in the flesh and it's guarded in the text. This is important. The birth of Jesus, even though we are never told to celebrate it, it is something that is worth celebrating. It is worth defending. It is worth honoring. It is worth standing on, it is worth defending because without it, beloved, the whole of the gospel falls apart. Jesus was no ordinary man. She was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Look there at the, in Matthew 1. In the latter part of it, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph as he was thinking about putting away, calling off this upcoming marriage with Mary. The angel came to him privately in a dream and said, Don't fear to take Mary, thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. I don't understand everything about this. But all I know is that she was, she was impregnated in a way such that, such that the child within her was Jesus Christ and he had no human father. This is much different language that happened with John the Baptist. You know the angel said to Zacharias, the father of John the Baptist, uh, we won't turn there for time's sake, but in Luke chapter 1 verse 13, he said to, to 
Zacharias, he said, Thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son. You see the difference? Jesus had no physical, earthly father. It had to be that way. Jesus was born of the virgin. Christ's conception. And, 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 and while, and notice I'm putting an emphasis on the conception. Because I believe this is important. His birth, his birth was a miracle, yes, but his birth was very similar to any other birth. I mean, she, he was delivered in the same way that all other babies were delivered. She, he, 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 he came just like any other, but it was his conception where the miracle was at. It's important to point that out to folks, not only because he was conceived of a virgin, but also because life begins at conception. Amen. That's where life is at. And because of this, because he had no earthly father, he did not inherit the sin nature that we did. Look over there to Luke chapter 1 and verse 35. Luke chapter 1 and verse 35. And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. Look at that. That holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. He did not have the sin nature that we do. You and I, you and I, we inherit the sin nature. We've all been born that way, but Christ was not. In fact, in Romans chapter 8, verse 3, the Bible says, For what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh, God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. Jesus came in the likeness of sinful flesh, but He was not sinful. He was not sinful. His conception, His conception, was in a way in which protected his nature from defilement with depravity. And listen, folks, let me just say this, and then I, I, I promise I, 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 I don't plan to say any more about it, but regardless of where you stand on the Christmas holiday, this season, and I know we're almost over it now, but this season brings us an opportunity to point this fact out that this is what's important about it. And, and, and oftentimes when people talk to us about Christmas, some people, <clears throat> I don't celebrate Christmas, but some people on our side of the issue who don't celebrate, they become missionaries to tell why we don't celebrate it. So they go through the whole world, all over Facebook and everywhere, becoming missionaries telling about why we don't celebrate Christmas. And, and spend more time given the encyclopedia and all of that as to the background about Christmas. What a terrible missed opportunity that that is when we're dealing with folks when we could be pointing out the truth about Jesus Christ. There is much that we can use in this time when people do have especially in a world when, there, when there's not much being said about Christ, at least there's some. And we can use this as an opportunity, as a door to witness to people.
Amen. She shall bring forth a son, thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. You know what's so great about Jesus being born? Yeah, true, we may not know the day, but here's the deal. He came to save his people from their sins. Are you a sinner? Have you been saved? Not that he might or hopefully he can save, but he will. Over in John chapter 1. John chapter 1. Verses 1 through 3. In the beginning. John chapter 1 verses 1 through 3. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. Skip on down to verse 14. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. We beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The Word was God. Jesus was God. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. We must not think of Jesus becoming man in the same way that the water was turned into wine. No, no. God above, the very creator of the world, became a babe in a manger, but he never ceased to be God. Great is the mystery of godliness. Spurgeon put it this way, he was abundantly manifest among the multitudes. And before his disciples during the latter part of his life, he was God in miracles most plenteous, but He was man in sufferings most pitiable. He was the Son of the Highest and nevertheless a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. He trod the billows of the obedient sea and yet He owned not a foot of land in all Judea. He fed thousands by His power and yet all faint and weary He sat upon a well and cried, Give me to drink. He cast out devils, but was himself tempted of the devil. He healed all manner of diseases, and was himself exceeding sorrowful even unto death. Winds and waves obeyed him. Every element acknowledged the august presence of deity, and yet he was tempted in all points like as we are. Our Lord's manhood was no phantasm, no myth, no mere appearance in human shape. Beyond all doubt, the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Handle me and see, saith he, a spirit hath not flesh and bones as ye see me have. Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands. Reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. Yet with equal certainty, God was manifest in him. As the light streams through the lantern, so the glory of God flamed through the flesh of Jesus. And those who were his nearest companions bear witness. We beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. End quote. Yes, God was manifest in the flesh. And it became more evident, more extraordinary, when our Lord the very creator of heaven and earth condescended to be put to death on the cross by his own creatures. He was given a mock trial and condemned as guilty the cruelest of crimes, the greatest of crimes. He was hung on a cruel cross. This is a great mystery to consider only revealed in Scripture and believed on in faith, He hung there on the cross. But the pain and the suffering that He received at the hand of the Roman soldiers, Pilate and others there, what He received from man is nothing.
compared to the three hours of darkness when the Father turned off the lights of this old world and he cried out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? For it was there, it was there on that cross that he suffered the hell that you and I deserve. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21. It says, For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. At the cross. Christ took our sins. He knew oh. our sin so that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. None of this would have been possible. None of it would have happened. None of it could have happened if Jesus, if God had not become incarnate. If Jesus had not been born of a virgin that day, some 30 some odd years earlier. Back into our text there in 1 Timothy chapter 3. Verse 16, without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh justified in the Spirit. Secondly, we see He was justified in the Spirit. Justified in the Spirit. This is speaking of, I believe, of the Holy Spirit. We see the Holy Spirit bore witness of Christ throughout all his life here on earth. In Luke chapter 1 and verse 35, we already uh, made mention of this, but I'll, I'll look at it again. Luke 1, 35, The angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing shall be born of thee, shall be called the Son of God. At his birth, we see the Holy Ghost uh, was there, bearing witness of who Jesus was. Uh, over in the book of Matthew, chapter 3, Matthew chapter 3, and verse 17, Matthew chapter 3, verse 17. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Let's, let's go up to verse 16, I'm sorry. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. We see the Spirit bearing witness of who Jesus was, uh, bearing witness of uh, the, the ministry of Jesus Christ at his baptism, him being justified in the Spirit. Uh, chapter 4. Verse 1, it says, Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. We see Him being led of the Spirit to His temptation. Uh, in Matthew chapter 17, Matthew chapter 17 and verse 5, Uh, in, uh, 
in the uh, in the transfiguration there we see here it says that um, while he yet spoke uh, behold a bright cloud overshadowed them and behold a voice out of the cloud which said this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased here ye him and so we see the father well the spirit there in his transfiguration and then in Ephesians chapter 1 Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 20 
be it unto me according to thy word. And the angel departed from her. So we see the angels saw him. Uh, seen of angels. Uh, not only that, but also uh, when he was tempted there in Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4. Verse 11 says, Then the devil leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. The angels are ministering spirits, the Bible tells us. And for sure, the angels were ministering unto him. He was seen of angels. Uh, we could talk about the angels being at the Garden of Gethsemane, and we could talk about some other things, but I want to go all the way up to His glorious resurrection in Matthew, um, or, uh, Matthew chapter 28. Let's praise God when He died and was buried. He did not stay in the grave. And... Uh, he did not remain dead in, in Matthew chapter 28. Verse 1. As we remember our Lord preach the gospel. The gospel is not complete without the resurrection. The angels were witness of that. In Matthew chapter 28, beginning of verse 1, it says, In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene, the other Mary, to see the sepulcher. Behold, there was a great earthquake. For the angel of the Lord descended from heaven, came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning, his raiment white as snow, and for fear of him the keepers did shake and became as dead men. And the angel answered and said unto the women, Fear not ye, for I know that you seek Jesus, which was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said, Come see the place where the Lord lay, and go quickly, and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead, and behold, he goeth before you into Galilee, there shall you see him. Lo, I have told you. See, the angels had to be there. They had to be there. They, they, they were witness to what happened. They had to be there. The stone was rolled away, not so that Jesus could get out, but that stone had to be moved so that the women could get in, so that they could see what was inside. And the angels were there so that they could explain to the women and give instruction from our God. Praise God that this is recorded for us. He was seen of angels at His resurrection, but also when He ascended up into heaven in Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1, verses 9 through 11 and in Acts chapter 1, verses 9 through 11, it says, And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, You men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner, as you have seen him go into heaven. He was seen of angels. They were there. They were there. As the disciples received their, uh, they, they, they were there, they were, they were uh, you know, asking him questions, uh, uh, questions like, hey, are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel yet? What's going on here? And then, when he had spoken these things, they beheld, and a cloud took him up out of their sight. You know, Jesus could have left and, 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 and been gone. I 
than God for the angels. They're not God. We don't worship the angels. But I thank God that He was seen of angels. And I, th I thank God for their testimony. I thank God that their, their record is here. They are ministering spirits. Yes, He was seen of angels. They told. They said, You men of Galilee, why do you stand here gazing up into heaven? Jesus is coming back. He is coming. Praise God. Praise God. He was seen of angels. And though Christ did not die for the angels. You ever think about that? You see, when Jesus came, He came as a man to die for men. He did not come as an angel to die for angels. When an angel sins, that's it. There's no hope for the angel. They're forever lost when they sin. He was seen of angels. And although it, Christ did not die for them, there are things that the 